If a storm of debris clogs the outflow drain for internal eye fluid, the pressure can spike. In a healthy eye, the amount of debris a typical surgery or laser surgery creates causes maybe a brief pressure spike, but isn't too challenging to clear quickly. Some drains aren't healthy and are gradually losing function over time. If you had cataract surgery recently or other procedures, and clearing the debris was challenging, AKA you were on pressure drops for weeks before it finally came down, that's a sign that your drains are likely not healthy and you should be watched more closely going forward than the average patient and maybe be considered a glaucoma suspect. We often can't predict who will have pressure spikes by looking ahead of time because most glaucomatous drains look normal. Pigment dispersion syndrome is a well-known anatomical condition where pigment debris is created in the absence of surgery. These patients are very high risk of pressure spike from surgery. See these patients for same-day post-ops because I've seen multiple go from normal to over 70 the next day. Pigment dispersion irises are always shedding pigment, especially after a workout. And if you look at the peripheral iris, you can see where the pigment's rubbed off because the light shines through. The iris either bows backwards or is too close to the structures behind it such that it rubs every time it constricts and dilates and that's what releases this pigment. This 18-year-old patient had pigment deposited everywhere, especially in her drain. Her iris bowed backwards so much that she actually qualified for a laser procedure to flatten it out. And you better believe that we watched her very closely for any pigment storm pressure spikes after the laser. Some patients who don't have glaucoma yet are at risk for an acute glaucoma attack because they have narrow angles. We often perform laser surgery to treat these narrow angles as a preventative measure. I have such a scenario for you today. On the surface, this case looked quite routine. We have a 52-year-old female who has pressures that are just a little bit outside normal with no medicines. Gonioscopy was completely narrow, appositional everywhere except the inferior angle where it was open to at least some trabecular meshwork. This was confirmed with the cornea light wedge. The patient had a thick dark brown iris. Not being dilated because of the narrow angles, the doctor can still see that the nerves look healthy. And the rest of the exam is normal, so the plan is to do a laser peripheral iridotomy for narrow angles left then right. Any concerns? If a patient already required multiple pressure drops, of course we'd be concerned, but here? I think many of us would not be concerned. Let me assure you, if you just missed it, that was a perfect storm. Let's show you what I mean by that. We unfortunately don't have any slit lamp gonioscopy images of this patient. Some of these teaching images are very helpful for the discussion of this case, but if you really want to learn a lot about gonioscopy, I recommend gonioscopy.org. How open an angle is is determined by how many structures you can see. The cornea light wedge terminates on Schwalbe's line, and sometimes you see pigment there called Sampalese's line, but not always. That's the first pigmented line you'll see. Next, going posterior, you have the trabecular meshwork. Most patients have enough pigment in their eye that the posterior TM is another brown line. The TM is the drain, which returns fluid to the venous system by Schlem's canal. Then, of course, you have the scleral spur, and then if the iris inserts posteriorly enough, you may be able to see some ciliary body, which would be the third brown line. Our case, the inferior angle, superior mirror, was open to slit posterior trabecular meshwork. This incredible image from gonioscopy.org looks similar. And a light wedge, which terminates on Sam Palacy's line, demonstrates that the lower line is actually the trabecular meshwork. But wait, compression wasn't done in this case. If it was, 
Would the angle have opened up to show the full trabecular meshwork as depicted here? Or would the angle open up all the way to show ciliary body? Does compression open the angle to sample Lacey's line, trabecular meshwork, or all the way to ciliary body? That's important to know. All of the other angles were appositional. And the question is, would compression have opened them up some, as in this case? In this patient, compression wasn't noted. So how can we know if these narrow angles are openable or scarred shut in a drain that's just hanging by a thread waiting for a storm to kick it over the edge? Also, this patient had thick brown irises. Why does that matter? This will be easy to understand if we review how a peripheral iridotomy laser helps narrow angles. I have a little footage directly from our website in the glaucoma section to illustrate this. In a normal sized eye, there's enough space between structures such that the iris and lens have enough space so that fluid can flow between them. This way, the iris stays flat. It's not getting pushed forward by any fluid building up behind it. And as a result, the angle between the iris and cornea stays wide open so that the fluid has plenty of access to the drain to get out of the eye. Let's scroll down to the bottom of this webpage to show an eye that has narrow angles. Eyes with narrow angles are typically smaller, and especially if the lens grows throughout life, the space between the lens and iris can actually go away. With this contact, the fluid flows through slower and builds up some behind the iris. That way the iris is not flat. It actually will bulge forward some. With this bulging, the angle between the iris and cornea becomes much more narrow. This eye is in danger. If that angle were to become any more narrow after being dilated or randomly, then the pathway to the drain could become completely shut and the pressure could go through the roof. But a laser hole in the iris can help. As long as the iris is not scarred in a narrow position, then a little hole in the iris lets the fluid flow through so the iris can relax back and it's no longer narrow. But remember, the laser releases pigmentary debris. Not so much on a blue iris, but a lot more with a thick brown iris. So let's review our narrow angle case where the angle is shut everywhere except inferior where it's almost shut. What if you're dealing with not just a narrow angle, but a scarred angle? Then a laser hole probably won't help. Assuming normal trabecular meshwork function, how much of the angle needs to close in chronic angle closure glaucoma prior to pressure elevation? And the answer is that there's a wide range from person to person, but often you won't see much pressure rise until the final quadrant starts to close. Which quadrant tends to be the last to close? The inferior. What type of iris releases the largest pigment storm during a laser iridotomy? That's right, a dark brown iris. Consulting Sir Isaac Newton, which direction does gravity pull the pigment? <laughs> to help you with your glaucoma problem, we're sending a storm to your only remaining open angle. Okay, let's see what we've gotten ourselves into. It's customary to check the pressure after 45 minutes. Whoa, it's doubled. Let's give this patient topical and oral glaucoma medicines. Everything we've got, this pressure is going to drop like a rock. Oh no, what next? Well, now the patient's going to be referred to a glaucoma specialist. That's me. Here's some drops to numb your eye, and I'm going to drain a little fluid. Carefully, it's a shallow chamber with a natural lens right there. And despite all these medicines, it's on its way back up again. Now what do we do? The answer is goniosyniculysis. Because a growing cataract lens is part of what causes the crowding and narrowing in the first place, you have to remove the cataract before you can do goniosyniculysis. Boom, look at that. That iris was scarred across the angle. Not just reversible apposition, it's been appositional for so long that it's scarred into that position. It's a lot easier to see with the cataract out with all the extra space. So we go around for 360 degrees 
and break all of these scars. The hope is that the trabecular meshwork underneath has enough function to still control the pressure. Some take home messages. The next time you see a perfect storm eye, consider doing cataract surgery instead of a PI. Many studies suggest that cataract surgery alone is more efficacious and safer compared to doing a PI. I'm particularly fond of this study, which suggests adding GSL. Of 52 eyes, 90% walked away with normal pressure and no medicines. A trend seen in this study in many since is that GSL is more likely to be efficacious if the apposition is not inflammatory, not neovascular, and if it hasn't been too chronic. I figure it's worth a try. I've saved many patients from further glaucoma surgery by doing that. However, if you choose to do a PI and you're concerned about the risk for pressure spike, I recommend doing a combination argon yag PI. The argon thins and coagulates the tissue to minimize the amount of debris released. I've still seen some patients spike uncontrollably with this treatment. Every eye is different and might need more treatment. But if you want to try a PI first in an at-risk eye, I recommend cataract measurements first. That way you're not struggling to get cataract measurements with a high pressure and corneal edema. You'll need a cataract surgeon ready. If the patient has just mild PAS, maybe just a chamber irrigation is all you'll need. But severe PAS with an eye that's been put over the edge might need cataract surgery with GSL. Follow up in one week? <laughs> I know you know better than that. Speaking of it, how was our patient doing at one day? This case goes to show that goniosyniculiasis can have a profound effect. Let's try to catch those perfect storm patients ahead of time for all our sakes. Thanks for watching.